He was bigger than boxing. Muhammad Ali was the most important man in the world. He was larger than life. His magnetism just was amazing. Who is this guy? He was a revolutionary. He was a groundbreaker. What are they going to say about that now, huh? Ken Burns captures an intimate story of victory, defeat, and determination. The price of freedom comes high. I have paid, but I am free. Muhammad Ali. The four-night event begins Sunday at 7 on WPTW. Hello and welcome to Muhammad Ali, a WTTW preview and community conversation. My name is Tim Russell, Vice President, Community Engagement and Diversity, Equity and Inclusion for WTTW. And, and our purpose is to enrich lives, engage communities and inspire exploration. I couldn't be more thrilled for tonight's preview and community conversation in anticipation of Sunday night, 7 p.m. premiere of Muhammad Ali on all WTTW platforms. The new four-part documentary directed by acclaimed filmmaker Ken Burns and co-directed by Sarah Burns and David McMahon chronicles the life of the legendary boxer who floated like a butterfly and stung like a bee. I hope you will explore our companion website at wttw.com slash Ali. When I was a young boy, my brothers, friends, and I all wanted to be Ali, not Frazier, Foreman, or Norton, but Ali. Our backyard in Oberlin, Ohio had this almost perfect square, space between a tree, a pole, and a corner of the garage, where we would create a makeshift boxing ring. We would Im imitate the boxers of the time, and we had to take turns being Ali, because whoever got to be him always won. They would get to wear a championship belt made out of paper. However, as I got older, I truly appreciated and understood what Ali meant to me my brothers and my friends. He stood up for what he believed in and was willing to risk it all for that. He was unapologetically black during a time when just like today, it could be difficult to be an adult black male, to walk through these two worlds, worlds and not worry about offending anyone or having someone be afraid or to see you as this angry person. Today, you will have the opportunity to preview selections from the film and Paris Shucks co-anchor of WTTW Chicago Tonight will moderate a conversation with the film's co-directors, Sarah Burns and David McMahon, Donald Lassier, president of the Chicago History Museum and former head of the Muhammad Ali Center in Louisville, and Ibu Patel, founder and president of Interfaith Youth Corps. They will discuss the years Ali lived on the south side of Chicago, his life and legacy, and the intersections of sports, race, religion, and politics. Before we begin, WTTW's presentation of Muhammad Ali is made possible in part by Benny's Beverage Depot. Major support comes from Rita and John Canning, Marshall Fields V, Danny and Sandy Cummings, Sylvia Ferner, the Mary and Mark Hoppy family, Larry and Mary Mages, and Catherine M. and Frederick H. Waddell. I would also like to thank our members and the audience, without whom this evening, and our programming would not be made possible. Thank you. Now let's watch the introduction to the film, followed by Paris Schultz, co-anchor of Chicago Tonight. Do you want some breakfast? I want some food. Can I have some of your food? Oh, I don't want none. I won't take none. I won't take none. I won't eat none if you don't want to. Oh, look at that pretty horse. Is that a white horse? See? Oh, now stand up. Look over there. Stand up. You got to stand up over that field. See the big one? There he is. My earliest memories that I can think of as a child with my father are walking through airports and being in crowds and, and feeling in my the vibrations of people's clapping and shouts in my chest. And just looking at my dad, you know, like, who is this person? And it was all the time, anywhere we went, you're the greatest, we love you, and the clapping, and Muhammad. Abu Abu I loved feeling all the energy and the love that he felt. We now think of Muhammad Ali 
as this vulnerable guy lighting the torch in Atlanta, and everybody on the globe loves him. Black people like him, white people. He's a universal hero, like, but almost in a religious way, like the Buddha. But when he was in the midst of his career, and not just in the early bit, he was incredibly divisive. Boo, yell, scream, throw peanuts, but whatever you do, pay to get in. People hated him, whether it was along racial lines, class lines, Vietnam lines, political lines, religious lines, where they just couldn't stand him. And people, of course, had the opposite, and this was, I loved him, loved him. But you had an opinion about him. You look at me, I'm loaded with confidence. I can't see me. I had a 180 hours to fight. One, two, three, five, 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 he was a groundbreaker, a guy known simply as the greatest. I am the greatest. I've wrestled with alligators. I've tussled with a whale. I done handcuffed lightning and put thunder in jail. You know I'm bad. I can drown a drink of water and kill a dead tree. This will be no contest. Wait till you see Muhammad Ali. I'm away, I'm away. To have that chutzpah. And to be a black man in America was just, it was outlandish. Muhammad means worthy of all praises, and Ali means most high. And I just don't think I should go 10,000 miles from here and shoot some black people that never caught me. I just can't shoot it. I always wonder why Miss America was always white. Santa Claus was white. White swan soap, king white soap, white cloud tissue paper, and everything bad was black. Black cat was the bad luck, and if I threaten you, I'm gonna blackmail you. <laughs> So mama, why don't they call it white male? They lie too. I love being around him. I love being around Muhammad Ali. You gonna float like a butterfly and sting like a bee. Ah, rumble, young man, rumble. Ah. The price of freedom comes high. I have paid, but I am free. Freedom, freedom, I can't move. Freedom, cut me loose. The winner and still heavyweight champion. Keep on running cause the winner don't quit on themselves. He called himself the greatest and then proved it to the entire world. He was a master at what is called the sweet science, the brutal and sometimes beautiful art of boxing. Heavyweight champion of just 22 years old, he wrote his own rules in the ring and in his life, infuriating his critics, baffling his opponents, and riveting millions of fans. At the height of the civil rights movement, he joined a separatist religious sect whose leader would, for a time, dominate both his personal life and his boxing career. He spoke his mind and stood on principle even when it cost him his livelihood. He redefined black manhood yet belittled his greatest rival using the racist language of the Jim Crow South in which he had been raised. Banished for his beliefs, he returned to boxing an underdog, reclaimed his title twice, and became the most famous man on earth. He craved adulation his whole life, seeking crowds on street corners, in hotel lobbies, on airport tarmacs, everywhere he went, and revel in the uninhibited joy he brought each adoring fan. He earned a massive fortune, spent it freely, and gave generously to family, friends, even strangers, anyone in need. Service to others, he often said, is the rent you pay for your room here on Earth. Even after his body began to betray him, 
and his brain had absorbed too many blows. He fought on, unable to go without the attention and drama that accompanied each bout. Later, slowed and silenced by a cruel and crippling disease, he found refuge in his faith, becoming a symbol of peace and hope on every continent. Muhammad Ali was, the novelist Norman Mailer wrote, the very spirit of the 20th century. I'm always going to be one black one who got big on your white televisions, on your white newspapers, on your satellites, million dollar checks, and still look you in your face and tell you the truth and 100% stay with and represent my people and not leave them and sell them out because I'm rich and stay with them. That was my purpose. I'm here and I'm showing the world that you can be here and still free and stay yourself and get respect from the world. Wow, what an introduction that was. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Paris Schutz. I am, as Tim Russell mentioned, the co-anchor and reporter for Chicago Tonight here on WTTW in Chicago. Uh, that really leaves you wanting more, uh, no doubt. Uh, so tonight we are going to discuss Ken Burns' new documentary, Muhammad Ali. It's a four-part film profiling the iconic athlete and activist of course, known as The Greatest. It premieres on all WTDW platforms beginning on September 19th at 7 p.m. So all of you right now are in listen-only mode, but that doesn't mean you can't be part of the conversation. We do want to hear from you. Uh, so please chime in with the chat function with your questions and comments, and I will try to share as many of them uh, with our guests. We will be doing a Q&A here uh, for about 40 minutes and then we will take some of uh, our audience questions and speaking of our guests it's time to introduce them uh, they are sarah burns and david mcmahon the film's co-directors donald lasier president of the chicago history museum and former director of the muhammad ali center in louisville and ibu patel founder of the interfaith youth corps here in chicago thank you all so much uh, for joining us and we're going to look at a few more clips uh, throughout this conversation but I want to begin with the uh, obvious question uh, for you, Sarah Burns and uh, David McMahon. You know, given all that's out there uh, documenting Muhammad Ali, feature-length film, books, documentaries, uh, why did you want to take on this project? And what, what what is the story you want to tell here? Well, it was about seven years ago when Chicago's own Jonathan Ige, the writer and reporter, came to us and said, I'm working on this um, this comprehensive biography of Muhammad Ali. And I just get the sense that while there are all these great uh, documentaries out there about him that cover a single chapter in his life or a single fight, there's nothing that braids all of the threads together of this really comp complex life. And so we looked into it a bit and found that he was absolutely right. And we actually began shooting about five years ago, just the week after he passed away. And so it was a, a five-year project. Um, and I think that is what we were trying to do is we were trying to take um, a spiritual journey, a political journey, an athletic journey, and make sense of how they all sort of happen together. Mm -hmm. And to offer a portrait of somebody um, who has served as an inspiration now for, um, for decades and across a period of time when he was rendered almost silent by Parkinson's. And so there seemed to be still some mysteries about who he was, and we thought there was an opening there to pull it all into one space. And and Sarah Burns, you know, talking about uh, his life journey, you know, going back to the very beginning, born in Louisville, uh, grows up Cassius Clay. By the age of 21, he's he's already world famous. He defeats Sonny Liston to become the heavyweight champion of the world, or maybe he had just turned 22 uh, at, at that point. And you mentioned in the film how divisive he was in those days, because we, if you know, my generation, we remember him as this revered, uh, lovable figure. Uh, so how was he... Uh, received, you know, his loquaciousness, his braggadocio by white audiences, black audiences, especially as you consider America barely out of the Jim Crow South. Yeah, it's a great point. I think that we, it's easy to forget how despised he was during parts of his career. And we, you're right, we now think of him as this beloved figure, and he certainly was that. Um, but 
in the early days, he was disliked um, by a lot of people for a lot of different reasons. You know, when he first showed up on the scene, the sports writers who were almost all white men of a certain generation who did not appreciate the way that he bragged, the way that he talked, um, the way that he behaved. You know, there, there were certain expectations of decorum um, that were expected from a heavyweight champion or a heavyweight contender. And these sports writers did not like that there were you know there was a younger guard too who had different feelings about it but i mean i think that was a big factor at that time and then he joins the nation of islam and he changes his name to muhammad ali and that turns a lot of people off people who feared the nation of islam who saw it as a hate group um that's you know white and black americans alike in many cases were afraid of the nation of islam and what it represented and then he refuses induction in the military early on in the Vietnam War when it was still rather popular. And so all of these things combine in these different ways. And, and there are, you know, there's a quite a large segment of the American population that really reviles him. Um, and it's, I think, an import, a really important part of his story to understand that evolution that he did not, he was not always this beloved figure by everyone. And, and Ibu Patel, I want to pick up on the Nation of Islam. But remind us, um, you know, what the organization was like in the 1960s, what the perception was, and how important it was to Muhammad Ali. Yeah, so uh, my name is Ibu Patel. I'm founder and president of IFYC. I'm thrilled to be a part of this. Let me just say how much I love this film. It is, it's achingly beautiful. It's epic. I wake up early and I watch 45 minutes or so every day uh, before before the rest of my family wakes up and it just it just lifts me it's done so well Sarah David to the two of you to Ken and others who worked on it just a big thank you so I'm certainly no scholar on the nation of Islam uh, but I know uh, a little bit just because of my general background in the sociology of religion and as an American Muslim so it is uh, it's really a black nationalist movement that emerges actually earlier in the 20th century. Uh, Elijah Muhammad takes it over in the middle part of the 20th century, and they do a masterful job of, in some ways, kind of grafting dimensions of, of Muslim language into a Black nationalist uh, um, ideology, and they effectively make it a theology. And one of the things that my friend Rami Nashashibi, who runs the Inner City Muslim Action Network down on the south side of Chicago, points out is, it's basically, uh, it's basically simply a reversal of white supremacist ideology. So white supremacist ideology basically has uh, the understanding that white people are, are made superior, black people are made not just inferior, but in effect worse than inferior. There's a theological reason why white people should rule and dominate. Basically, Nation of Islam ideology is, is a reversal of that. And it's a kind of sacralization of that with, with, um, with Islamic language. Uh, uh, and it attracts, uh, for you know, reasonable reasons, at a time of unbelievably ugly, violent, hateful racism, uh, it is it it uh, it attracts a set of people in part because it articulates not just separatism but pride and dignity. And I think that that we should remember that for the Nation of Islam, although I disagree with its ideology. I disagree with its theologizing of that ideology. It stands first for pride and dignity for a group of people that the nation did not give a lot of pride and dignity to. And it is no surprise in my mind that a very bright, young, ultra talented young man from Louisville who couldn't go to amusement parks in Louisville because he's got the wrong color skin and who's like, why is, why is Miss America always white? Right. What what's what's up with that? It is not a surprise to me that he is in in his younger days attracted to that to that group. But uh, Donald is here. Given that, I mean, you see uh, young Cassius Clay, Muhammad Ali. He doesn't seem to espouse those kinds of uh, views in his life. You know, he he his his managers are, are, are a group of white men. Um, he had that relationship with Howard Cosell. So how, how did Nation of Islam form his, his personal identity in those early days? And I think you're, uh, I think you're on mute, Donald. All right. There so, you go. Yeah, let me pick up a couple of things that Ibo said. Growing up on the south side of Chicago, when there were members of the Nation of Islam in my neighborhood around, I felt safe. So 
this is one of the things that people need to understand. They represented, as he said, a certain dignity that black men weren't shown in America. So Muhammad was always a very proud and confident person. And he had a strong conviction, not only about religion, but about himself. And so when he saw that people of his color were demanding respect, were standing up with dignity, of course he would be attracted to that because that represented who he was genuinely as a person. You know, he believed that he was the greatest. That wasn't just some, something that he was pretending to say. He believed it. And so it's not a surprise that an organization, a people, uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, who said, you are great just because you are Black, that would make a lot of sense to someone who already had that much confidence in themselves. And, and, and by the way, you talk about uh, uh, Elijah Muhammad and Malcolm X, uh, Sarah Burns, a really fascinating part of episode one, I think, is, is how Ali is kind of caught in the middle of, of this feud between Malcolm X and Elijah Muhammad and where the Nation of Islam is going to go to the point where some speculate uh, whether he was kind of like their prize, like they wanted him uh, to, to advance their own agenda. Can, can you just talk about that relationship a little bit? Yeah, I mean, he became really close to both of them each in different ways. You know, I think Elijah Muhammad became something of a father figure and mentor to him. And Malcolm X was more like the older brother mentor figure to him. And he was really close and I think in, greatly influenced by both of them. And when Malcolm X begins to split away from the Nation of Islam and from Elijah Muhammad, um, Ali then he still then Cassius Clay is really caught in the middle. And I think it's true that both, you know, Malcolm may have hoped that that he would that he could bring Cassius Clay with him into this sort of new organization that he was going to form. Um, and Elijah Muhammad, once he becomes the champion, uh, wants him, wants to make sure he stays part of the fold. And so there is this this sort of moment when it feels like Ali could go either way. He could choose one path or the other. And it's actually right at that moment when Elijah Muhammad gives him the name Muhammad Ali. Mm. Um, and, you know, I, I assume that had something to do with it, though it's far more complicated than that, of course. Um, but he does choose Elijah Muhammad. Um, he chooses the father figure. Um, and that's the direction that he goes. And he, he later in life speaks about his regret at turning his back on Malcolm X. Um, I think that was a difficult thing for him to do, despite how he sort of presented it in that moment, his rejection of Malcolm X. Um, but I think he really was caught in a very difficult situation there. And let's remember how young he was. I mean, he's just in his early 20s at the time and in, in getting all this information. All right, let's go to, to one of the clips. Uh, and this involves uh, Ali in a difficult situation in front of the Illinois Athletic Commission, uh, about uh, his his remarks over Vietnam. Uh, let's take a look at that clip. Ali's next fight had been scheduled for March 29th, 1966 in Chicago against the six foot six Ernie Terrell the boxer who had been awarded the World Boxing Association title after they had stripped it from Ali. Most boxing fans still viewed Ali as the real champ, and a defeat of Terrell would cement his claim. I want our soldiers and Marines to see what a real champion looks like, said Terrell, who promised to sign up for an exhibition tour in Vietnam after defeating Ali. And we announced the fight, and tickets were going very well, and we were securing closed-circuit exhibitors around the country. I had hoped it would be the biggest Ali promotion ever at that point. When Ali said, I got nothing against the Viet Cong, Mayor Daly immediately contacted the Illinois Athletic Commission and told them to throw us out of Chicago. To salvage the fight, 
Ali backed away from his statements and offered to come before the Illinois State Athletic Commission to apologize. But after having breakfast with Elijah Muhammad before the hearing, he reversed course. I'm asking you if you apologize for the unpatriotic remarks that you made. Anything, I'm not apologizing for nothing like that because I don't have to. I'm apologizing to the uh, armed, the people who in charge of the selective service. Those are the people that we'll take this up with. I'm not in court now for that. I'm a champ of the world. This is athletic commissioner, and I'm here to fight for the title, and I'm just apologizing for what I said to the newspapers and to the press when I should have had these things to say, and they will from now on be said with the people who are in charge of this. Mr. Clay, when Muhammad you, Ali, sir. Mr. Clay, Muhammad Ali, uh, sir. Mr. Muhammad Ali, either yes, one. Sir. Just Muhammad Ali. When sir. you appeared before this commission before, if I recall correctly, you said you were the people's champion. Yes, sir. Do you think that you're acting like a people's champion? Yes, sir. Ah. That same day, the Illinois Attorney General declared the fight illegal. We determined that the application and the license violated state law. I don't know what kind of statements Clay made. The only thing that I can figure out about Clay is he's guilty of being stupid. And once we got out of Chicago, every city in the United States virtually did a pylon. And the pylon was, Kalamazoo will not accept the fight. You know, nobody asked them. But it, so it became obvious to me that we couldn't do the fight in the United States. Aram eventually found a venue for the fight in Toronto, Canada. But Terrell rejected the terms of the new contract and pulled out. With less than three weeks to go, promoters scrambled to find another opponent. George Chevalo. The Canadian heavyweight champion agreed to take Terrell's place. He's going to fight George Chevallo in Toronto because that patriotic mayor, uh, Daly of Chicago, has said he can't abide the traitors fighting in his midst. So I go up there and I come to Sully's AC gym. I go in the back. And Luis Saria, the Cuban exile, is giving him a massage. He said, What are you doing here? I saw somebody said there's a fight. He said, No, you know, this is not much of a fight. I said, well, I'll tell you the truth. Muhammad, I got, I'm not going to lie to you. A lot of young American men who do not want to fight in this war for reasons of conscience or religion or whatever else are coming to Canada and they've been granted political asylum. So I'm here to see if he got home. He got off that thing so fast and got on my face, I thought he was going to hit me. He said, you know better than that. He said, look, and these are the words, I remember them so well. America is my birth country. No one's going to chase me out of my birth country. I belong in my birth country. Now, I don't make the laws in my birth country. So if the law says I got to go to jail, I'll go to jail. Elijah did, I will do it, but I'm going home to my birth country. And you could tell that to everybody. I was positive he'd go to jail if he had to. George Chevallo lasted all 15 rounds giving Ali what he called his toughest fight yet. So Ali uh, <laughs> meets his match in Mayor Daly uh, when he comes to Chicago. Uh, David McMahon, I'll, I'll go with you here. Why, why was this such a flashpoint here in Chicago? And, and, and you mentioned his, his opposition to Vietnam came pretty early on in the process when the war was still popular. How was that viewed across the country? Well, this at this point, Muhammad Ali is at the absolute height of his athletic powers. Um, he's doing things in the ring that no one has ever done before. And so there are titles to defend. There are um, there's money to be made. And he gives all of that up um, because of this principle. I'm not going to go overseas and fight poor, dispossessed people of color. I'm not afforded all of the rights and luxuries of an American citizen here. And I don't care what you're going to take away from me. And I think there are a lot of people using their platform today in sports in a wonderful way um, to to uh, to speak on behalf of people who don't have that platform. I, I just think nobody has ever the stakes have never been higher than they are for him. And at, at this point, Mayor Daly is in the in Chicago Athletic Commission is pulling his license, and it, it and he goes into exile. 
And from there, I think to be relevant, he's got to get his title back. And it begins a multi-year climb, seven or eight years until he fights George Foreman. And, and as Howard Bryant says later in the film, that's part of what makes him compelling is that he is stripped of his title and he does go on this journey. And so many things happen across that journey. He's proven right about the Vietnam War. The Nation of Islam seems a little less menacing than it does in the mid 60s. He loses to Joe Frazier and people come around and they begin to appreciate him. They see that he's human. And then he goes to Zaire and he defeats George Foreman, who people aren't worried that he's gonna lose. They're worried that he's gonna get killed. And he wins and he doesn't have that athletic, the same speed anymore. So he has to use his wits. And what happens after he wins? Mayor Daly gives him a medal and throws him a parade. And so it comes full circle. And that's, it's Howard Bryant says, this is why we love him because he gets it all back. And so I think it kind of starts there. You know, he just before that, he fights Cleveland Williams. And we're looking as the, the boxer, Michael Ben says, we're looking at Picasso or Miles Davis. I mean, he's, you can't touch him. He's embarrassing his opponents. Imagine if he had those three years to defend that title. He would not have lost. Imagine the money he would have made. Imagine how he would have broadened his fame. Um, and he gave it all up for the principal. So amazing that uh, Mayor Daly uh, evolved there uh, in his thinking. Um, Ibu Patel, speaking of uh, evolution, um, you know, he started, uh, Ali started one place with, with his views and, and his views on Islam. How, how did his spiritual life evolve and, and where did he end up um, as, as a practitioner of Islam? Yeah, let me just, let me just say a, a few things um, about some of the dimensions about, about that clip first, if you will. Uh, sure. um, so first of all, I just want to say like that five minutes of film, like, is there a, is there a more perfect five minutes Right. I mean, the Sam Cooke. So I'm serious. Right. It's just artistry. It's just artistry. The images, the voiceover, the writing, the way the Sam Cooke song comes in. It's just it's beautiful. And and that's not Ali at his most articulate, but it's a part of Ali and David and Sarah show that. I just think I just think it that is an that's kind of that is how this. This several hours captures Ali and in that five minutes, you kind of see the, the, the artistry at play. And I just think there's so many profound things in the content there, right? America is my birth country. Nobody's chasing me out. If I, if, if, if that means I follow the laws of the land and it puts me in jail, I mean, that's Socrates. That's what Socrates says, right? Athens is my, Athens is my country. If they're putting me to death, I disagree with it, but it's, but, but if I can't claim Athens, Athens can't change. And that's part of what Ali is doing here, right? Because I'm not running away. I am involved in the change process of the nation. I'm involved, and, and look, Mayor Daly the first can change, right? <laughs> and, and I actually think one of, the, one of the things that makes Ali, I mean, maybe the most compelling American figure of the 20th century, right? Maybe the single most compelling figure is, is his, in his person, he kind of contains the appetites and the instincts and the victories and the triumphs and the emotions of an entire country right? The brashness and the gentleness and the generosity and the petty, all of it, right? It's all there in this person. And he also reveals it to the nation. He's kind of a mirror of those instincts and appetites and emotions and all of that stuff to the whole nation. Ali changes. Ali, Ali is not always the brash boxer of 1966. He is, in 1986, this gentle man who honestly... The, the Muslims I know are a lot more like Ali in 1986, right? They're marked by gentleness. They're marked by generosity. It is one form of dignity. Brashness is another form of dignity. I'm not saying Ali in 1966 isn't the real Ali. I'm saying that's, you know, Ali at 23 or 24. That's the brash and dignified Ali. In 86, it's the gentle and generous and dignified Ali. In 96, it is the world icon. That is also Ali. Right. That is also Ali. And, and I love how he changes. He says in the film, the wise man changes. Right. The wise country also changes. And, and I just I think that in, in this in Ali, we see America. And in this film, we see Ali and therefore ourselves. And, and Donald Asir, you came to know him in, in those very later years running the Muhammad Ali Center. Yeah, by that time, he couldn't really talk much. But did, did he have any reflections? Uh, uh, to you about his faith, uh, about what he wanted his legacy to be, about the journey that he had been on. 
Yeah, so I've, I had uh, conversations with Muhammad, like you said, he wasn't speaking much. I talked a lot with his wife, Lonnie Ali. Um, he wanted his legacy to be one of a man of peace, generosity, and love, conviction. He had six core principles in which he lived by. I want to go back to something about that 1966 clip. That was the brash Ali. But the thing about Muhammad is he was always a generous person. Giving was one of his core principles. His first professional purse, when he was still Cassius Clay, he gave that away to Cozair's Children's Hospital. So throughout the film, and I think Sarah and David and Ken did a wonderful job of talking about his generous nature. That was always with him, right? So he did evolve as a man, which we all do. You know, no one who is 24 is going to be the same when they're 60. You know, he had a quote similar to that. You know, a man who was the same at 50 if he, as he was at 20 has not really lived a good life, right? So you're going to evolve. And where Muhammad evolved, like Ebo was saying, from 66 to 86, is he was no longer a boxer. He didn't need to promote fights. And that's a wonderful thing about the film. It showed the drama that he created around every fight, which was amazing. You know, having, you know, been associated with Muhammad for many years, that's one part of the film that I really enjoy because a lot of other documentaries about him don't show that drama that he created. That's what he was doing in 1966 creating drama of, to promote his fights. That's really, really what it was. It, it was almost like a P.T. Barnum level <laughs> genius. He didn't care as long as you paid to get in and the fight was a big uh, success. You know, on that subject of legacy, this next clip uh, deals with that, uh, talking to his daughters and, and a bunch of other folks. So let's take a look at that. Ali, late in life, talked about this tallying angel, he called it, that there was an angel up there who counted all the good things you did in life and all the bad things you did in life. And if you had more bad things than good things, you were going to hell. And he had a very vivid impression of what hell meant. And he acknowledged that he had a lot of negative marks, that the tallying angel was not going to be uh, happy with the way he had treated women in particular. 30 years after Ali first faced Joe Frazier, a reporter asked him about their long-running feud. I called him a lot of names that I shouldn't have called him, Ali admitted. I apologize for that. I like Joe Frazier. Me and him was a good show. Frazier never forgave Ali. Later, he expressed sorrow at having abandoned Malcolm X. Turning my back on Malcolm was one of the mistakes that I regret most in my life, he wrote. I wished I'd been able to tell Malcolm I was sorry that he was right about so many things. Daddy evolved, he became better. And Daddy said that I'm bigger than boxing. That meant boxing was this much His evolution into the person he is today is way bigger than him just boxing. And I think he knew that. And he carried it with him, his love. And he gave it to every single person he met. And I think that's beautiful. As the 20th century came to an end, Newsweek, Time, and Sports Illustrated all named him Athlete of the Century. In the days after the terrorist attacks of September 11, 2001, American Muslims were the victims of hate crimes simply because of their faith. I am a Muslim. I am an American, Ali responded. If the culprits are Muslim, they have twisted the teachings of Islam. Whoever performed the terrorist attacks does not represent Islam. 
God is not behind assassins. What I hope is that Muhammad Ali will be a constant reminder uh, uh, to America of just how thoroughly American a believing, practicing, sincerely committed Muslim can be. Whatever one's background is, Ali belongs to America, all of us. And I think that he belongs to all of us because he affected all of us. And I hope that that's part of the legacy that he will leave, that America won't forget Ali as this American Muslim with, with equal emphasis on American Muslim. On November 9th, 2005, President George W. Bush presented Ali with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, the highest civilian honor in the United States. That same year, the Muhammad Ali Center, a museum dedicated to his life and legacy, opened in Louisville. Muhammad Ali was an activist who fought to reach us a certain way and to move America in a certain way, and to move individuals in a certain way. I'm going to take this path. I believe that I'm right. And even if I'm not right, I'm still me. And to be able to follow that and to know that there was going to be an enormous price to pay for that and to have that be generational, to have that live on beyond you is extremely valuable. Everything that he did couldn't be undone. And uh, before we get to some of the audience questions here, you know, we've talked about the big issues, the big picture uh, um, topics, but we haven't talked about boxing. And, uh, and Sarah Burns, um, first of all, what was it about his, his boxing style that was so unique um, beyond just him being such an amazing athlete? I mean, he really revolutionized the sport. He did. He had a pretty unorthodox style and certainly one that a lot of trainers might have tried to correct uh, in someone else. But he was so confident in himself and what he was doing. I think that, you know, Angelo Dundee very smartly understood to, to let him do that and ended up being a genius style. I also think it's important to remember that he worked really hard at being that good. So he had this, you know, innate talent, this skill, this ability to measure the distance and stuff like that. But he also put a huge amount of effort into becoming the greatest. Um, but yeah, he, his style was unusual. He would, he kept his hands low, right? Boxers are taught to, to protect themselves, right? With their hands up. And, and in order to avoid a punch coming at him, he would lean back to get away from it. And that is not how any boxer is taught to fight. Um, but it worked for him in part because he had this incredible ability to measure the distance between himself and an opponent. And that helps him offensively in terms of knowing the best way to make that punch sort of have the greatest impact. And also in terms of how far away he needs to be to get away from it. But that also, as we were talking about before, applies to that early part of his career. It applies when he is at his athletic peak. He has this incredible speed. His footwork is, is sort of faster than certainly most heavyweights. Um, and that's how he is just, you know, he rarely gets hit in those early fights in the 60s. He just doesn't, no one can touch him practically, um, with a few exceptions. And he wins every single fight. And he, there is that point, Dave was talking about it, where he's fighting Cleveland Williams and Ernie Trell, and he just seems unbeatable. It's hard to imagine who could possibly win. When he comes back from his exile, though, He's a different boxer. He's lost some of that speed and he's gonna have to figure out different ways to win. And that often involves um, his brain too, which he was of course using before. Part of that is the, the taunting and the sort of psyching out your opponent part of things. Um, but he had to actually outsmart them in the ring too after that. And, and Donald this year, I mean, he had, he had as documented in the film, this, these epic battles with Joe Frazier and then he expresses remorse at the end of his life um it, it, how 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 personal was it between them i mean how how ugly was that relationship um it was ugly <laughs> it really was but i want to say something about muhammad the fighters that he fought against there's a clip uh, about larry holmes who teared up larry absolutely loved muhammad george foreman who he said awful things about absolutely loved muhammad 
Ernie Terrell, who probably was the most brutal fight Muhammad had, and him at his very worst and meanest, ended up loving Muhammad. So when you talk about that evolution, the legacy of love and peace and respect that he wanted, he ended up having because while he did and said some awful things, he was very apologetic and genuinely apologetic that he had done hurtful things. And so I just wanna point that out that the people he fought, George Havala, um, others, all had this ultimate respect because of what he did outside of the ring. They viewed that as way more important than the show that he put on to promote the fight because they knew it was a show. Mm -hmm. Now, it really was personal between he and Joe Frazier. That was true, mm -hmm. you know, um, but there were pictures of them together later in life where they at least could appear in the same room. Well, <laughs> that's progress. Uh, David McMahon, uh, speaking of progress, the, the, the evolution of the perception of Ali, we talked about your film gets into this at, at the very end, um, where he was perhaps divisive in his early career by 1996, when he's holding the torch at the Olympic Games in Atlanta. At that point, he's this beloved icon, one of the greatest Americans, universally acknowledged that to be that. How and why did that perception change? Well, I think that in 96, when he appears at the Olympics, that he, America sort of rediscovered him. I think in the States, he had kind of gone quiet a little bit as a Parkinson's patient um, who wasn't the quick uh, talker that he had been. Um, but at the same time, he's going overseas to Muslim countries. And, you know, I think across his career, he could draw a crowd at a, at a New York street corner anytime he wanted to. When he would go to the Muslim world at that time, the entire nation would stop and they would come out to celebrate him. And so I don't think his fame sort of diminished ever overseas, but I think America, I think perhaps due to issues of race, perhaps due to his, um, the, some people's sense that he was a draft dodger, perhaps due to others sense um, that the Nation of Islam, a separatist sect, was a dangerous organization that he was affiliated with. Um, there was a, a long history, and it's clear in 96 that he had been proven right over and over, and people, I think, were eager to return to him. And I, I think what people told us was maybe he had lost a little confidence. I think Lonnie says this. Lani Ali, his widow, um, and this, you know, 3 billion people or whatever it was saw this and they, they collectively gave him a hug. And so I think um, he was out there spreading his faith and he was out there globally um, spreading love. Um, and I think it, it took America a minute for those people who had forgotten about him or had disliked him for one of those reasons to come back and embrace him. And, and Ibu Patel, you know, in that last clip we saw, um, they talk about how it was just important to him to be seen as an American Muslim, those two things. Uh, what, what was his stature in the American Muslim community at the end? I mean, you know, Sherman Jackson, who's, who's all over this film as an expert, he, he's amongst the most highly revered scholars in American Islam. And I think, you know, what he says about Ali is, is just is... Uh, is very moving and true, which is this in in so many ways is kind of an archetypal figure uh, of an American Muslim, and it's it's not because he was perfect, right? I mean, Ali's treatment of wis women is 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 the is detestable, right? It's detestable, uh, um, and he, here are all these like beautiful, gentle images of Ali at this Jewish senior center in Miami, where he's living. He lives at a Jewish senior center while he's training for a fight. And, and, you know, these all, these Jewish bubbies, these Jewish grandmothers are like, he seems like a nice Jewish boy, right? I can't believe he's a boxer. I mean, my favorite Ali story is the story that Billy Crystal tells about him at his, at his, at his funeral. Uh, and Billy Crystal says, you know, uh, Ali, in the in 70s or early 80s, or whatever, says, hey, you wanna come with me uh, uh, for my five mile run at the Louisville, at the Louisville Country Club. And Billy Crystal says, I can't champ, sorry. And Ali says, you scared, you, you, know, you, don't, you don't want to get laughed at me. And Billy Crystal says, man, they don't let Jews in there. Honestly, they don't let black people in there except for you. 
And Ali is so, it's, it's just so violated by that. He never, he never goes to the club again. I mean, that for me is like Ali, the American Muslim, right? Ali, the interfaith hero, the person who kind of, who exemplifies these values of Islam, of, of you honor everyone's identity. Everyone is a, is, is a container of the human soul. You honor their identity. You don't let them be violated, right? I think that there's like, in, in so many ways, there's this deep sense of dignity and decency that Ali has in this kind of easy way with folks uh, that comes out at this Jewish community center, this junior Jewish senior center. I do want to say, like, I, in contrast to that, right? Um, I mean, one of the things I think that comes out in the film, I think that David and Sarah do really well, is is there is a part of Ali's brashness that feels like that feels like uh, he is not only performing, but he has kind of been painted into a corner and performing, right? Like you would think that Ali by 71 would not honestly make racist statements about his opponent, Joe Frazier, calling him stupid and ugly, et cetera, that there was something, there was something of a performance there, but it's almost as if he felt like he needed to do it, mm -hmm. right? Uh, he's he's too good of a man for that. He's certainly too smart for that. Uh, what what? How did America paint Ali such that he felt like that was the way to get the cameras watching? Mm -hmm. Part of his genius was changing in the ring, and part of his genius was shifting that persona in the '80s. Right? I am the greatest because I'm the most generous. Mm -hmm. I am the greatest because this this pugilistic fighter in the ring is actually this unbelievably gentle man with children, right? right. I just think that's part of his genius. And, 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 and the, uh, I think uh, Sarah and David, you talked about just his need to be loved. Uh, Donald, uh, let's, let's bring it to the, to, to the current day. We had, uh, we have athletes that, that are controversial because they stand up for, for social justice issues, for race issues or for political issues. Colin Kaepernick took a knee and 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 it effectively ended his, his uh, football career. You've got um, professional athletes that were very outspoken in the wake of the George Floyd murder. Um, so how how different is the climate now in responding to athletes that use their platform to bring attention to these social justice issues uh, than it was in the '60s and the '70s when Muhammad Ali did it? Well, if you look at athletes today. Some of them will admit that it's their obligation because they have a large stage and a large platform to seek social change, to seek social justice. And a lot of them point back to Muhammad doing that in the 60s and 70s. The difference is, and, and when you talk about the Vietnam War, people don't understand how popular it was when it first started. Almost 70% of the country supported the war. Now that was reversed by the end of it, but that allowed Muhammad to become sort of a, a different persona, um, not a draft dodger, but someone who really was a conscientious, conscientious objector. But what he was able to do was teach young people like me at the time to stand up for what you believe in, but be willing to accept those consequences. Now athletes have so much power over you know, their brand and what have you, that they can still go out and while they're still risking some earning, some of their you know, brand equity, if you will, they have a willingness to do that because they saw a man in his early 20s give up everything at the peak of his power to stand up for what he believed in. And that is a great example and an inspiration that many young athletes point to today. In many ways, that, that took more courage than even standing in the ring. Um, we have one question here uh, uh, in our uh, Q&A um, bubble, and it's from Art H. And the question is for Sarah and David. After completing this film, how did your perception of Ali change? Or did it change? <laughs> <laughs> sure. Um, that's a great question. Um, I entered this 
knowing little about boxing and only having a sort of popular sense of who Muhammad Ali was, um, I think that, and we've definitely talked about some of this, but um, I didn't appreciate that this was a man on a spiritual journey and that it began with his discovery of the nation of Islam, which was a way for him, as we've talked about, of explaining the world that he inhabited at that time. A young man searching for identity while all the while knowing that he wanted to be the greatest and believed with all of his heart that he could. And that that journey across a lifetime evolves. Um, and it also reveals, um, as he grows and matures, just the size of his heart. Mm. And that in the Muslim world, as I said before, he was a massive hero. People named their children after them. They would come across a nation to have him bless a newborn baby. And I, I just didn't see this as a spiritual journey. And it instantly became clear that it was. And it was a lot of other things too. But that just seemed, it was for me, the best way to understand the life that he was living. And I think he ratified that for me at the end in the clip that you just saw as there, those the three talking heads are trying to unpack his legacy, um, that it was about spreading his faith and about spreading his love. And it, it was about being able to speak out after 9-11, um, that his faith, and then it was about understanding his own life and what that meant to him as he went on to a next life. Um, and. I think that gave brought clarity for me that um, this was a man at the center of his life with his was his faith. Sarah, how about you? Did anything about your perception change? You know, I think for me, working on a project like this with any of our projects is always a process of discovery. I also was not, you know, didn't know that much about Muhammad Ali. I knew some things. You can't avoid that, but. Um, you know, so for me, I, I love this opportunity to get to know him through this archival material and really hearing Ali speak for himself across all those years and to feel like you really can get to know him. He's really, he's always himself. And we've talked a lot about this evolution, but I mean, you feel like he is authentically himself. He's insisting on being himself at all times. And so you, we have this wonderful opportunity, even though I, never got a chance to meet him in life, but to get to know him in this really intimate way through this material. And so all of that feels like this wonderful discovery to get to, to know him in that way. And I think for me, the thing that struck me from the very beginning was just everyone we encountered as we were working on this project, just strangers, you know, what are you working on now? Muhammad Ali, everyone's got an Ali story. And I think that speaks to the way that he impacted so many people, the way that he his generosity, the way that he shared himself and sort of spread that love around, engaged with people, that you have so many people who had these brief encounters with him on a street corner in an elevator, you know, he signed an autograph for them. And it's this experience that they will carry with them for the rest of their lives because of the way that he made people feel special and feel seen and feel loved, even in like a minute long encounter. And so that was something that I don't think I understood before. And that really struck me from the very beginning of this project about just who he was and the impact he had on everyone he encountered. All right, well, we only have about a minute or so left. So Donald and Ibu, I wanna just give you a chance uh, at, at some final thoughts about the film, uh, about what you want the viewers of this panel to take away about the life of Muhammad Ali. I'll, I'll start with you, Ibu. Ibu. Yeah, I have to say, uh, so uh, Ali dies in June of 2016. Uh, we all know what's happening politically in June of 2016. And, and, and it, it, for me, it's just like we give him, America gives him a state funeral, a, literally a state. It is carried on network television. Bill Clinton speaks. And there's a Muslim funeral as well uh, in, in, uh, in Louisville. And I just, that like in the summer of 2016 with the craziness of our politics and just the ugliness of it. I thought to myself, this is my country. We gave the greatest American of the 20th century a state funeral as he deserved. Donald, how about you? Well, being in Louisville at the time of this memorial service, I have to echo some of the things that you said and Sarah and David said. There was for a whole week, no crime in Louisville. Although there were literally hundreds of thousands of people that had come to the city 
for the memorial service. There was absolutely no crime that was happening out of respect for Muhammad. And when you think about the fact that billions and billions of people watched the memorial service and that it was all different faiths that spoke at that service, it showed the true spiritual journey as David articulated that Muhammad was on. Inside the Muhammad Ali Center, there's a, a pavilion called spirituality. And in that pavilion, which he helped author, it has sayings from all different religions. And as his daughter, one of the twins said, Rashida, that was one of his favorite things to say that all religions contain truth. Mm. That's a profound quote. All right. Well, that, that's all the time we have. Sarah Burns, David McMahon, Donald Lassier, Evo Patel. Thank you all. Such a fascinating discussion. Uh, you can't sum up a life like that in an hour, but maybe in, in a, in a four-part uh, documentary. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I have to remind everybody that that documentary premieres beginning Sunday, September 19th, 7 p.m. through Wednesday, September 22nd on all WTTW platforms. In addition, WTTW has a companion website which paints a deeply humanizing portrait of Muhammad Ali's life in Chicago. And so visit that website. It's at uh, wttw.com slash Ali. And in addition to that, join WTTW and PBS Books on Tuesday, September 21st, 4.30 p.m. via Facebook Live for a performance and talk with Kwame Alexander, author of Becoming Muhammad Ali. And my co-anchor uh, uh, and colleague, Brandis Friedman here at Chicago tonight will be moderating that conversation. With that, uh, I wanna thank everybody again. I wanna thank all of those who tuned in. Thank you all so much and have a great rest of your week. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Paris and Tim.